feels kind of odd to be talking about him in October. It's like, hey, it's not February. But I say every month is Black History Month. Woo! Yeah. That's yeah. The of our campaign. <laughs> <laughs> we'll put her on <laughs> every month. Every month is a good time to study figures in church history. Well, good morning and welcome once again to another uh, installment of our church history series. Uh, we've been focusing on, uh, most recently, we've been focusing on developments in 20th century American church history. And, you know, we talked about Billy Graham and we talked about how Billy Graham had uh, befriended Martin Luther King Jr., or maybe it was the reverse. Martin Luther King Jr. maybe befriended Billy Graham. But anyway, they got connected, and uh, that was a very important connection um, uh, in the time period in the United States that we're going to be talking about. And of course, I think everybody in this room knows who Martin Luther King Jr. is. Is there anybody who doesn't? Now, we all know who he is. Interestingly, when we talked about Martin Luther, the German reformer from the 1500s, there were a lot of people who did not know who Martin Luther was. Uh, but now we're going to talk about Martin Luther King Jr. Here we are in 20th century America. And of course, um, he is uh, perhaps best known as the civil rights leader uh, for black Americans in the 20th century. Uh, there were many other leaders, many other pastors who led the fight for civil rights for American blacks, but Martin Luther King is surely the, the best known. He was born on January 15th. Um, let me go ahead and, yeah, oops. <clears throat> there we go. Uh, he was born January 15, 1929, in Atlanta, Georgia. He was the second of three children born to Michael King Sr. and Alberta King. Her married name was Williams, uh, or rather her maiden name was Williams. And he had an older sister, Christine King Ferris, and a younger brother, Alfred Daniel, or A.D. King. Uh, King's maternal grandfather was a Baptist minister. And King's father was the son of illiterate sharecroppers. So two very different families um, in terms of their circumstances at this time in the early 20th century. Uh, Michael King Sr. left the farm as a teenager and walked 20 miles to Atlanta, Georgia to obtain a high school education and then attended Morehouse College to study for the ministry. In 1931, after working his way through college, King Sr. became pastor of Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta, where his father-in-law had pastored. King Jr. was born during a time of great economic and social change for black Americans, but of course, this was also a time of continued frustrations and limitations for them. The formal and informal segregation laws known as Jim Crow throughout the southern U.S. were still in place. Segregation was also a way of life in many parts of northern states with fewer economic, social, and political opportunities for black Americans than for whites. And you can see here, this is a sign that would have been posted uh, in a public area. I think it was connected with uh, a railroad station. Um, everything was segregated in the South. Martin Luther King Jr. experienced these limitations as a child. King became friends with a white boy whose father owned a business across the street from his family's home. In September of 1935, when the boys were about six years old, they started school. King, of course, had to attend a black-only school, Young Street Elementary in Atlanta, but King's friend went to a whites-only school. And soon afterwards, the parents of the white boy 
stopped allowing King to play with their son, stating to him, we are white and you are colored. And this is a, a really nice photo of the King family home. It is still standing. And if you uh, take a vacation to Atlanta, if you take a trip there, there is a whole national park. Uh, I forget which portion of Atlanta it's in, but uh, it has the King family home, Ebenezer Baptist Church. It's, it's kind of like they took the neighborhood where the King family lived and where Martin Luther King Jr. worked uh, for many years, and they made it into a national park. Um, so you can tour the home. Uh, if you if you know if you're ever down there, uh, this house was originally built for a white family, but King's maternal grandfather, the Baptist pastor, purchased the home for thirty five hundred dollars in 1909. That was a bargain, <laughs> but of course back then that would have been a, a huge amount of money. Um, King told his parents about this situation with his white friend, and the. The parents had to have a long discussion with him about the history of slavery and racism in America. Upon learning of the hatred, violence, and oppression the blacks faced in the US, King would later state that he was determined to hate every white person. But his parents instructed him that it was his Christian duty to love everyone. Once, out walking with his father, they were stopped by a police officer who referred to King Sr. as boy. King's father responded sharply that King Jr. was a boy, but he, King Sr., was a man. At a shoe store in downtown Atlanta, the clerk told them they needed to sit in the back. King's father refused, stating, we'll either buy shoes sitting here or we won't buy any shoes at all, before taking King Jr. and leaving the store. And he told his son afterward, I don't care how long I have to live with this system, I will never accept it. And in 1936, King Sr. led hundreds of blacks in a civil rights march to the city hall in Atlanta to protest voting rights discrimination. King Jr. later remarked that King Sr. was a real father to him. And in this, he was very fortunate to have such a strong male influence in his life, caring for him in a very fatherly way. And of course, this example stayed with Martin Luther King Jr. his whole life. King Jr.'s favorite hymn to sing was, I want to be more and more like Jesus. He moved attendees with his singing. Not surprisingly, scripture was read and discussed frequently in the King household and King memorized and recited Bible verses from the age of five. As he grew older, King Jr. began to go to church events with his mother and sing hymns while she played the piano. This is Ebenezer Baptist Church, uh, where King's, uh, Martin Luther King Jr.'s grandfather and father both pastored, and where he later pastored. And this is how it appeared in the 1960s. Ebenezer Baptist Church has expanded. If you were to go and visit it today, uh, you would see much larger and a more mo modern buildings around it. It's become part of the National Park in Atlanta. Oh yeah, oh yeah, it's still going on. I mean, this, this church is so famous. Uh, I can't begin to tell you, it's so famous. King Sr.'s efforts, along with those of other black Christians to advance civil rights in Atlanta, resulted in the integration of elevators in office buildings, equal pay for black teachers, and desegregation of the city bus system in 1959. Efforts to end segregation and promote social change also resulted in the Great Migration. Millions of blacks left the predominantly agricultural southern U.S and moved north and west in two waves, from 1910 to 1930, and then from 1941 to 1970, looking for jobs and opportunities in cities. King Jr.'s opportunities were much greater in the city of Atlanta than they would have been in the rural parts of Georgia from which his parents and grandparents came. He was very fortunate to get a good education 
In September of 1940, at the age of 11, he was enrolled at the Atlanta University Laboratory School for the seventh grade. And because this was a laboratory school, a laboratory school is, um, you know, there have been different types of these all over the country in different places. But this is where the best teachers will go to try out new teaching methods. Um, and a lot of times they give students who attend them much more educational opportunities than they might get in a standard public school. And while there, King took violin and piano lessons and showed keen interest in history and English classes. He wanted to expand his vocabulary, so he took up reading the dictionary. But the resentment against whites due to the racial humiliation that he, his family, and his neighbors often had to endure in the segregated South was a constant backdrop to his teenage years. In 1942, when King was 13 years old, he became the youngest assistant manager of a newspaper delivery station for the Atlanta Journal. That year, King skipped the ninth grade and was enrolled in Booker T. Washington High School, the only high school for black students in Atlanta. He maintained a B-plus average and joined the debate team. On April 13, 1944, in his junior year, King gave his first public speech during an oratorical contest sponsored by the Elks Club in Dublin, Georgia. In his speech, he stated, Black America still wears chains. The finest Negro is at the mercy of the meanest white man. Even winners of our highest honors face the class color bar. So th this was very outspoken at the time. King was selected as the winner of the contest, but on the bus ride home to Atlanta, he and his teacher were ordered by the driver to stand so that white passengers could sit down. The driver of the bus called King a very bad name. King initially refused to sit down, but complied after his teacher told him that he would be breaking the law if he did not follow the directions of the driver. And here you see pictured a typical sign that would have been in uh, a bus or a train station. Uh, again, public transportation was completely segregated and it was illegal for blacks to sit in white sections. I don't think we can fully appreciate how difficult it would be to live in a society where you see these signs everywhere you go when you're out in public, everywhere. Restaurants were segregated. Um, businesses uh, that did uh, do business with blacks would often make them, you know, enter through the, through the back door to the business. They couldn't come in through the front. It was endless. It was pervasive. As all the seats were occupied, he and his teacher were forced to stand on the rest of the drive back to Atlanta. And later, King wrote of the incident, saying, that night will never leave my memory. It was the angriest I have ever been in my life. On May 18, 1941, the death of King Jr.'s maternal grandmother due to a heart attack was a great blow to him and the whole family. And he struggled with her loss. His father explained to him that she had been called home to God. This is part of God's plan. It can't be changed. And of course, you know, it's hard for a child or a teenager to come to grips with the fact that everybody dies. Uh, but he was grappling with this, uh, you know, for him, a very new experience. <clears throat> but he was not sure that his parents could really know where his grandmother had gone. And while he had grown up in a Baptist home, uh, you know, attending church every Sunday, Baptist pastor, grandfather, Baptist uh, pastor, father. He was still skeptical of some of Christianity's claims, and especially so as he entered adolescence. And he began to question the literalist teachings preached at his father's church. At the age of 13, he denied the bodily resurrection of Jesus during Sunday school. He found himself unable to identify with the emotional displays during services uh, from church members. You know, so the black church is expressive. He, d he couldn't relate to that. 
During King's junior year in high school, Morehouse College, an all-male, historically black college that King's father and maternal grandfather had attended, began accepting high school juniors who had passed the school's entrance exam. So here's another fortunate break for, for uh, Martin Luther King Jr. to attend college. With World War II underway, many black college students had enlisted in the armed services, decreasing the number of students at Morehouse College. The university aimed to increase their student numbers by allowing high school juniors to apply. And in 1944, at the age of 15, King passed the entrance exam, and he was enrolled at Morehouse for the fall term. And here you see pictured Graves Hall at Morehouse College. Morehouse College is still going strong uh, in Atlanta. Um, you can go visit the campus, again, if you're ever in the Atlanta area. Uh, you can tour this, this part of the city. Um, this is how it was shown in 2016. The buildings, you know, had renovations and, and so forth, and it's been kept up very well. Uh, the, this college was opened in 1867 to train former slaves to be Protestant ministers and educators. In the summer before King started his freshman year at Morehouse, he boarded a train with a group of other Morehouse college students to work in Simsbury, Connecticut at the tobacco farm of Coleman Brothers Tobacco, a cigar business. This was King's first trip outside of the segregated South into the integrated North. Now, when I say integrated North, again, keep in mind, some places in the North were more integrated than others. Um, some blacks still found discrimination in uh, parts of the northern US. But this particular area seemed to be uh, just very well integrated. Uh, so King wrote his father in June of 1944 and said, on our way here, we saw some things I had never anticipated to see. After we passed Washington, he means Washington, DC, there was no discrimination at all. The white people here are very nice. We go to any place we want to and sit anywhere we want to. The students worked at the Coleman farm to earn money for Morehouse. The farm had partnered with the college to allot their earnings towards the college's tuition, housing, and other fees. King and the other students worked in the fields Monday through Friday, picking tobacco from 7 a.m. till at least 5 p.m enduring temperatures above 100 degrees Fahrenheit to earn about $4 a day. But this was very typical for agricultural work at this time in the United States. You know, you might look at this and go, this is horrible. But it was very typical in 1944. Uh, on Friday evenings, King and the other students visited downtown Simsbury to get milkshakes and watch movies. On Saturdays, they would travel to Hartford to see theater performances, shop, and eat in restaurants. On Sunday, they went to church. Churches filled with white congregants, no discrimination. King wrote to his parents about the lack of segregation in Connecticut, relaying how he was amazed they could go to one of the finest restaurants in Hartford and that Negroes and whites go to the same church. The summer before his last year at Morehouse in 47, King, who was 18 years old at the time, chose to enter the ministry. Throughout his time in college, King studied under the mentorship of Morehouse's president, Baptist minister Benjamin Mays, uh, who King would later credit with being his spiritual mentor. King had concluded that the church offered the most assuring way to answer an inner urge to serve humanity. This inner urge had begun developing, and he made peace with the Baptist Church as he believed he would be a rational minister with sermons that were a respectful force for ideas, even social protest. Now, the fact is, King was essentially going down the path that, uh, frankly, many uh, Protestant ministers and pastors had gone down due to higher criticism 
Uh, hopefully you will recall when we talked about higher criticism uh, coming out of the Enlightenment in Europe in the 1700s, the idea that, you know, well, Christianity is a good thing, but the supernatural elements of Christianity don't really, you know, this stuff really didn't, it's not really true. You know, was Jesus born of a virgin? No. Did he really rise from the dead? No. Was there a historical Jesus, a man named Jesus who was a good teacher, uh, you know, in the first century in, in Palestine under Roman occupation? Yes. Yes, such a person existed. And his teachings, his moral teachings are so excellent. And we as Christians can follow those moral teachings, but we're going to leave out the supernatural aspects of Christianity um, because higher criticism, you know, deconstructing the texts of the Bible has shown us that, you know, all these supernatural things that are described in the Bible, those really didn't happen. It's basically myth. So he ended up, and we'll see this as we talk about his later education, he was very much, uh, his thinking, I would say, was very much in tune with liberal Protestant uh, ministers at that time who had basically embraced higher criticism and had a whole different approach to Christianity so that Christianity is not uh, filled with the supernatural power of God to change people, to convert them, to heal the sick, uh, to cast out demons. These supernatural things, it's just really myth. Um, and we're just going to focus on being rational, you know, so this idea that he wanted to be a rational minister. In other words, he's going to leave behind what he believes are the mythical elements of Christianity and focus on Christianity almost as a philosophy, uh, a set of moral teachings by which we should live. King graduated from Morehouse with a Bachelor of Arts, a BA, in sociology in 1948, age 19. Now, I'll tell you, a sociology degree would really mesh very well with a rational approach to Christianity. Uh, and to continue his preparation, he attended Crozer Theological Seminary in Pennsylvania and took classes at the University of Pennsylvania. And he graduated with a Bachelor of Divinity in 1951, and then he began doctoral studies in systematic theology at Boston University. Now, in Boston, there were a lot, a lot of uh, very liberal Protestant ministers. Um, churches in New England had really, these congregational churches had really embraced, you know, or at least their leaders, <laughs> truly embraced higher criticism, uh, deconstructing biblical texts, and, you know, had a great emphasis on the moral teachings of Christianity. So he, he's in a part of the country where Christians are very much steeped in this way of thinking, and he ended up embracing it. Uh, at, this, at the time that he was attending Boston University, <clears throat> he also served as an assistant minister at Boston's historic 12th Baptist Church with William Hunter Hester, an old friend of his father. At the age of 25 in 1954, he was called as pastor of the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama. King received his PhD on June 5, 1955 with a dissertation titled, A Comparison of the Conceptions of God in the Thinking of Paul Tillich and Henry Nelson Wyman. Um, and so, again, these are people, Paul Tillich and Wyman, uh, these are people who are basically in that whole higher criticism school of thought. Now, while studying at Boston University, he had met Coretta Scott. She was a student at the New England Conservatory of Music. After the second date, King was certain Scott possessed the qualities he sought in a wife. So he had, you know, I, I have to say, he planned his, his um, career very well. He, had, he, he was determined to finish his doctorate before he got married. In other words, he was going to be set vocationally 
before he got married and started a family. He was intentional about that. He was very fortunate to have met Coretta Scott. She had attended Antioch College right up the road in Yellow Springs, Ohio, where she had joined the NAACP and was politically active. So she was on the same wavelength as he was about the need for change in the United States, improving uh, lives for black citizens um, and bringing about true attainment of civil rights for blacks. Now, despite envisioning a career for herself in the music industry, Coretta knew that it would not be possible if she were to marry King. But since King possessed many of the qualities she liked in a man, she found herself becoming more involved with each passing moment. And when asked by her sister what made King so appealing to her, she responded, I suppose it's because Martin reminds me so much of our father. Her father was a pastor and She's gonna marry a pastor, and she knows what kind of a life she's gonna be living. At that moment, Scott's sister knew King was the one. Now, here's a picture of the King family in the mid-1960s. The Kings had four children, um, and those children went on as they grew up to be very active in the civil rights movement. Some of them are still alive today, um, and you know, you could, they've written books, they're very active, um, you can read about them on the internet. And here is a photograph of Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama, still standing, still functioning church. And this was where King served as pastor while finishing his doctorate. Coretta and Martin were married on June 18, 1953 on the lawn of her parents' house in her hometown of Heiberger, Alabama. They be began their married life in the midst of a growing movement to desegregate the southern U.S. Throughout southern cities, blacks began to stage protests, sit-ins, and boycotts, and began to demand civil rights and an end to segregation. In March 1955, Claudette Colvin, a 15-year-old black schoolgirl in Montgomery, refused to give up her bus seat to a white man in violation of Jim Crow laws. And here's a photograph of Martin Luther King Jr. and Rosa Parks in 1955. Rosa Parks, as you may know, did the same thing on December 1st, 1955. She refused to give up her seat on a city bus uh, where she was sitting towards the front of the bus and she was arrested. Black ministers of churches in Montgomery asked Martin Luther King Jr. to lead a black community boycott of the entire city bus system. Now what, what they were calling for was pretty radical. Uh, the boycott lasted for 385 days, more than a year. The city made carpools illegal, so many black workers were forced to walk everywhere. And of course, many, many black citizens of that city lived in parts of town uh, where there were no businesses. They, they were living kind of on the outskirts and to go to their work every day, they had to walk from you know what was almost being out in the country into town. They had to walk miles and miles, but they did it, all of them, and they did it for a very long time. They were determined. King's house was bombed. He was arrested for traveling 30 miles per hour in a 25 mile per hour zone and jailed. But this drew the attention of the national media. Again, this is the mid 50s. People are starting to get televisions in their home. More and more average Americans are getting televisions. And so now they're able to watch the civil rights movement unfold in real time. Every night on the evening news, you know, a lot of us today don't, you know, we're like, what's the evening news? <laughs> Greg and I still watch that because we grew up during this time and our parents and, and everybody we knew watched the evening news. And, you know, there would be journalists and, and you know, photographers and, and people with, you know, movie cameras down in the South filming these events. So this was shown on TV almost on a daily basis. 
So the controversy regarding this bus boycott ended when the U.S. District Court issued a ruling in Browder v. Gale that prohibited racial segregation on all Montgomery, Alabama public buses. And blacks resumed riding the buses again and were able to sit in the front with full legal authorization. King's role in the bus boycott transformed him into a national figure, the best known spokesman of the civil rights movement. In 1957, King, Ralph Abernathy, Fred Shuttlesworth, Joseph Lowry, and those names may not be super familiar to you, but they were active leaders at this time, active black leaders. Other civil rights activists along with them, both white and black, founded the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, the SCLC. The group was created to harness the moral authority and organizing power of black churches to conduct nonviolent protests in the service of civil rights reform. The group was inspired by the crusades of evangelist Billy Graham, who befriended King, as well as the national organizing of the group In Friendship, uh, whites and blacks who grouped together to provide financial support for the movement. Many of the civil rights leaders were, were jailed, um, and jail was not a safe place. And so they had to raise funds to bail these folks out of jail, because who knows what would have happened to them in jail. Oops. Martin Luther King Jr. and other black and white ministers and leaders formed the Gandhi Society in 1962. Martin Luther King Jr. studied the work of Mohandas Gandhi, the famous Indian, um, basically, leader. Uh, he was many things, but I'll, I'll just say he was a leader who helped India gain independence and throw off British rule. And his policies of nonviolent protests uh, were what led India to independence. And Martin Luther King Jr. said, this is the model we need to follow. Along with that, he took the, uh, the teachings uh, from the New Testament. Uh, you know, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount is telling people to turn the other cheek, to uh, love those who hate you, to don't lash back when people are attacking you, um, to love your enemies. Uh, you know, these, these ideas combined with uh, the ideas of nonviolent protest that he had seen Gandhi used really helped him solidify his vision for what this movement should be. And, and the goal of the Gandhi Society was to form a new society dedicated to progress through nonviolence, as he stated in a speech in Washington, DC. Martin Luther King Jr. was becoming displeased with the pace that President John F. Kennedy was using to address the issue of segregation at the federal level. I mean, think of it one city at a time to, to segregate, or desegregate rather, the buses. Look at the effort it took in just one city. The fact was the federal government needed to step in and it wasn't doing so. Because the fact of the matter is Jim Crow laws, the segregation laws, were totally unconstitutional, completely unconstitutional. So Martin Luther King Jr. and the Gandhi Society produced a document that called on President John F. Kennedy to follow in the steps of Abraham Lincoln and issue an executive order to deliver a blow for civil rights as a kind of second emancipation proclamation. But Kennedy did not execute the order. Kennedy was concerned that public allegations of communists in the SCLC would derail the federal civil rights initiative. This is the 50s. The Red Scare is in full sway. Okay, if you don't know what the Red Scare is, you should study this. During the 1950s, many, many people, especially the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover, the head of the FBI, were very concerned about communists uh, who were in, in the federal government, in state governments, in movements like uh, Martin Luther King's uh, Southern Christian Leadership Conference, the NAACP, all these organizations. Uh, Hoover and the FBI were, you know, searching for trying to ferret out communists. And Hoover was convinced that King was a communist 
and tapped his phones and he was followed and you know, he was basically harassed by the FBI. And the FBI was harassing a lot of other people at this time. And the, um, there were, um, there was Senator Joseph P. McCarthy who was uh, ferreting out communists in Hollywood and dragging people before his uh, Senate hearings and asking them if they were members of the Communist Party and do you know any other members of the Communist Party who are working in Hollywood? He went after this particular industry. So all of this, you know, fear of communism is enveloping the United States. At the same time, the civil rights movement is really trying to, uh, to gain ground. Kennedy warned King to discontinue associations with uh, communists. Um, and uh, Kennedy later ended up issuing a written, the written directive that authorized the FBI to wiretap King and other SCLC leaders. But King believed that organized nonviolent protest of the system of Southern segregation known as Jim Crow would lead to extensive media coverage of the struggle for black equality and voting rights. And of course, he was right. <clears throat> now here you see a picture of striking sanitation workers in Memphis, Tennessee in 1968. Um, basically, they're garbage collectors. Most garbage collectors in Memphis at this time were black. Um, they uh, received lower pay for doing the same type of work as their white counterparts. Uh, they were discriminated against in many, many ways. They're all holding signs that say, I am a man. Um, and later, uh, the, well, we're gonna get back to this uh, particular strike. We're gonna get back to Memphis in 68. Um, but this is just one picture out of thousands and thousands of all the protests that were going on, the boycotts, the strikes. And I, I, I would also say that labor unions were getting very involved with the civil rights movement. One time King was jailed and the person who bailed him out was the head of, I think it was the UAW, United Auto Workers. Uh, so the unions were very much involved with this and they saw that they needed to promote civil rights within their ranks. Media ac accounts in newspapers and televised footage of the daily deprivation and indignities suffered by Southern blacks and segregationist violence and harassment of civil rights workers and marchers convinced many Americans that the civil rights movement was the most important issue in American politics in the early 1960s. Again, this is on the news every night. Now, I'll also mention, along with that, they're televising the Vietnam War. So this is, this is truly a time of radical change in American life in terms of what people are seeing that is going on in the world that they wouldn't have known about in, for earlier generations. In December of 59, after being based in Montgomery for five years, King announced his return to Atlanta at the request of the SCLC and he served as co-pastor with his father at the Ebenezer Baptist Church until his death. When he came back to Atlanta, Georgia Governor Ernest Vandiver, uh, white of course, expressed open hostility toward King's return to his hometown in late 59. He claimed that wherever Martin Luther King Jr. has been, there has followed in his wake a wave of crimes and vowed to keep King under surveillance. So not only has he got the feds on his case, uh, you know, he's got local law enforcement on his case. Keep in mind that Southern local law enforcement is filled with KKK members. Let that sink in. By April 1963, Martin Luther King Jr. was back in Alabama for protests in Birmingham. Again, he was arrested and jailed early in the campaign. At this time, this was his 13th arrest out of 29 total arrests in his life. From his cell, he composed the now famous 
letter from Birmingham jail that responds to calls on the movement to pursue legal channels for social change. And this letter has been described as one of the most important historical documents penned by a modern political prisoner. In the letter, he wrote his famous saying, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Declare, um, sorry, I guess I duplicated a slide here. Declaring that black Americans had waited for their God-given and constitutional rights long enough, King quoted one of our distinguished jurists, probably referring to English jurist William Gladstone, that justice too long delayed is justice denied. And this is a central tenant of the American legal system. Uh, and for example, when you hear about people, ex uh, people who've been arrested for crimes and they wanna exercise their right for a speedy trial, um, that right to have a speedy trial comes out of this idea that justice cannot be delayed, otherwise it is injustice. Uh, so, and this is a fundamental tenet of both English and American uh, law. <clears throat> King, representing the, the SCLC, was among the leaders of the big six civil rights organizations, NAACP and others, who were instrumental in the organization of the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, which took place on August 28, 1963. And here's a photograph of Martin Luther King Jr. delivering his I Have a Dream speech. Uh, in the March on Washington, D.C. in 1963. He gave this speech in front of the Lincoln Memorial, facing out over the reflecting pool that, um, and on the internet you can find many, many photographs. You can, you can find film footage taken this day, uh, on this uh, event. Millions of people were in attendance. And this is just a portion of the speech. I say to you today, my friends, so even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. On March 29th of 1968, King went to Memphis, Tennessee in support of the black sanitation, uh, public sanitation works employees on strike since March 12th for higher wages and better treatment. On April 3rd, King addressed a rally and delivered his I've been to the mountaintop address at Mason Temple, the world headquarters of the Church of God in Christ. King was fatally shot by James Earl Ray at 6.01 p.m. Thursday, April 4th, 1968, as he stood on the Lorraine Motel second floor balcony. The city of Memphis quickly settled the strike on terms favorable to the sanitation workers. But the country exploded. There were riots in major cities throughout the United States. And here is a picture of the Lorraine Motel. <clears throat> it is now the National Civil Rights Museum in Memphis, Tennessee. And here is an excerpt from his speech. Well, I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead, but it doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop. 
and I don't mind. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over. And I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you. But I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. So that concludes what I have to share about Martin Luther King Jr. There is so much more to know about his story. And when you think you've learned all there is to know, you find there's more. He did so much in his relatively brief career. Uh, he would be in his 90s if he was alive today. Um, and these are just a few uh, sources. Um, in addition to the sources listed here, um, <clears throat> he wrote his autobiography, and you can read that. Um, and the, uh, the work that's cited here by David Garrow, Martin Luther King, an American Legacy, Bearing the Cross, Protest at Selma, the FBI, and Martin Luther King Jr. That's actually three books that now have been kind of combined into one gigantic book. And that is considered the definitive work on Martin Luther King Jr. in addition to his autobiography. Um, I recently ordered the book Bearing the Cross. Hopefully I can get through it because I have a ton of stuff to read <laughs> and time is short. Uh, any questions or comments? Connor. Um, I don't think so. I, I think he continued in his, what we would probably term liberal Protestant view of the Bible and of Christianity. I, I think he was so focused on uh, the work he was doing in the civil rights movement that I, I guess in a way it didn't matter to him. What mattered was the teachings of Christ that we can rely on and the idea of nonviolent protest can change a whole society. You know, he just didn't want to see, uh, you know, what happened after his death. I mean, you know, in 1968, um, I can remember sitting in front of a TV set looking at all of this and thinking, what's happening to America? Not long after Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated, Robert F. Kennedy was assassinated while he was campaigning for president. Um, you know, prior to all of this, of course, was the assassination of John F. Kennedy in 63. You know, the Vietnam War is just getting worse and worse all the time. Um, you know, it, it, was, it was a huge time of change in this country. But for Martin Luther King Jr., I think he was probably so focused. And I mean, you know, he is, he's getting jailed all the time. You know, uh, the police are harassing him. Other, you know, civil authorities are harassing him constantly. You know, uh, not only was his house bombed, he was stabbed. He was at a book signing. And a woman, it, ha it happened to be a black woman who was just mentally deranged, she came up and stabbed him in his chest. She was very, and it almost, it almost went through his heart. Um, he was rushed to the hospital. They performed surgery. They saved his life. Um, you know, his life is on the line. And the life of his family, too, was on the line every day. So I think when you're doing that kind of work, you know, um, I certainly would have liked if he had found real faith in in. Christ in terms of Christ being resurrected that is so central to the Christian faith and again we don't know you know you can read the works of someone but again to know what's really going on inside that person only God knows so I, I didn't see any evidence that he had changed his viewpoint regarding Christianity anyone else Greg
Yep. Very hard time. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yeah, and some people have speculated that um, uh, the man who assassinated King was actually part of a conspiracy. And just like JFK's death, you know, there have been investigations, you know, was this man truly just acting alone? But of course, the truth was, any white supremacist would have been happy to take him out at any time. So it wouldn't have taken a conspiracy, you know. <laughs> um, you know. He was assailed on every front. His life was always in jeopardy every day. Well, um, we'll break here so you can uh, take a break, get, get some coffee uh, before the next meeting.
All right, good morning, everybody. We are few, but we are still here. <laughs> um, if anyone happens to be watching, uh, congratulations, Byron and Jai, on getting married. Um, and many of our members are in Puerto Rico, so that's exciting. All right, well, let's start uh, by standing, and our call to worship is from Psalm um, 25. Verses 6 to 9. Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me, for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you this morning um, knowing that we are sinners and in need of your grace. And Lord, we confess before you that um, we have done things that we should not have done, and we have not done things that we should have done. But Lord, uh, we know that when we confess and repent, you are faithful to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So this morning, Lord, we come before you knowing that Christ is our righteousness, and we worship you this morning and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Give love.
thank you so much for this time. You are worthy. There's nothing better that we could be doing but lifting your name high. God, we pray that your glory would be shown to the nations more powerfully than it ever has been before. And Lord, we are your workers. Show us what to do in every moment. And that our hearts would be open to you, saying, you're the king, not me. You're the king. you, Lord, for this time. Thank you. Thank you for showing your power on earth. You didn't have to save us. You wanted to. Lord, we are amazed by your love. We thank you. That's all we can do. Lord, we ask that uh, the rest of this service, the rest of this day, the rest of this week, we would be uh, inclining our ears and our hearts towards you to hear what you would have us to do and hear you speaking over us. Thank you for all of this, and we bless your name, Jesus. Amen. Let's remain standing and proclaim our faith as it has been handed down to us in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, Grace Christian Fellowship. All right. Uh, So we've got a few announcements. Uh, The first announcement is about the reception for the Burke's wedding. Yes, so yesterday there was a beautiful uh, ceremony in Puerto Rico uniting Byron and Jailene, and uh, it was on YouTube. It was super awesome, but all of us here, we didn't join them there, but we get the opportunity to celebrate with them um, here in the States, October 15th. It's two weeks from now. Um, and if you haven't had an opportunity yet, please RSVP with Byron for attending that event at 5 p.m. Uh, October 15th. Happening today, there are two things. Uh, uh, one of those things is pressing it into the corners at 6 p.m. today at the Leopold home. And this is an opportunity for further discussion on the sermon series that has been presented by Stephen Leopold. And uh, you can meet at their home and uh, enjoy that. And for the last announcement for the thing happening today, we're going to have Catherine Weiss. Okay, uh, once again, I want to remind everyone, today is the Life Chain happening uh, on East Troop in Kettering. Uh, We are going to be standing in front of a Premier Health building, but we are not protesting Premier Health. 
I just want to make that clear. It just happens to be where they have put us for the life chain. How many here have participated in past life chains? Good, quite a few people. So you know what this is about. So in the spirit of Martin Luther King Jr. and all Christians who are uh, doing nonviolent protest for change, uh, we are protesting the continuation of abortion procedures that go on at the Women's Med Center on Stroop, uh, East Stroop in Kettering. Um, <clears throat> you know, we were all so excited when Roe v. Wade was overturned. And yet here we are still soldiering on uh, to support life and to convince people that by, by having an abortion, they're destroying a human life. It is murder. And the fact that it continues on as the law of the land, so to speak, even though that law is kind of up in the air, you know, different states are now deciding whether they are going to make abortion legal or not in that state, we have a responsibility to continue this fight to try to change the laws <clears throat> that are unjust, that currently allow abortions to be performed in Ohio. Um, along with this, please vote this November. Vote no on issue one. So the life chain uh, starts at, uh, yeah, 2 o'clock. Um, <clears throat> I'll be out there. The weather's good today. No excuses. Let's, let's show up and be present. And we are going to be holding signs. It is a silent witness uh, that we are, you know, basically saying to all who drive by, we're going to be holding signs provided by the organization that, that sponsors this. Um, we will be standing uh, from two to three holding our signs along Stroop Road. And uh, then from 3 to 3.30, um, they are encouraging people to gather in groups in front of the Women's Med Center and continue to pray to end abortion. Uh, any questions? Yep, I think we, most of us know, you know, the drill, so to speak. So, um, I don't know, people may want to carpool. You can carpool if you want. Um, you know, or you can just drive there and be there at two. All right, thanks. Sure, for the tithe and offer offering this morning comes from Second Corinthians nine, six through eleven. The point is this: whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. <clears throat> Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times you may abound in every good work. As it is written, he has distributed freely, he has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. Let us pray. Father, we, uh, this morning as we collect the tithe and offering, we trust that as we give earthly money, you will produce in us generous hearts. We trust in your word that as we give to you our, our increase, our money, you will give us a harvest of righteousness. Amen. The children and the children's ministry workers may be dismissed. Please stand for the reading of God's holy word. This morning I will be reading from Paul's epistle to the Philippians, chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. 
So, if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind having the same love, being a full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is, in, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father, to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work, for his good pleasure. This is the word of the Lord. How's everyone doing today? Let's open in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for this time to be together, uh, to fellowship, to worship you, to experience your grace, and to be reminded of your grace. Uh, we pray that you would bless the sermon, that you would uh, inspire us and give us clarity and help us to understand uh, what you designed the church to do and, uh, and how much we should expect the church to accomplish. Uh, we pray that you would uh, just give us grace in that, and we thank you for your love, and amen. So today we're continuing our series called the GCF Vision. Uh, the vision, or the GCF vision, is a term that we use a lot, but we haven't had a thorough teaching on it since Greg was teaching at RCF. Uh, so we're, we're doing this series where we try to concisely yet thoroughly explain what the GCF vision is. Uh, so in this series, we're focused... Uh, the GCF vision is that there are certain aspects of Christianity that God wants Christians to rediscover and restore. And in this series, we're focusing on five of them. Number one, having a biblically complete understanding of, experience of, and presentation of the gospel. Number two, being grace-based rather than performance-based. Number three, being reformed and charismatic. Number four, understanding the role, relevance, and responsibilities of the church. And number five, having a, a victorious eschatology. So we're still on part four of this series, or subsection four, understanding the role, relevance, and responsibilities of the church. 
Uh, last week, we talked about how the church is a family, and God wants Christians to actually think of each other as family and actually treat each other like family. Uh, today's will probably be the last one we do on understanding the role, relevance, and responsibilities of the church. Uh, today's sermon is called A Vision for the Potential of the Church. So my whole purpose for this sermon, there's only one point. There's only one thing you have to remember. My whole point for this sermon is to give a vision for the potential of the church. I want us to think about how much the church could accomplish if every member in every local congregation walked in the fullness that God has for us. It's kind of a mental exercise is kind of the point of this sermon, to really think about how much the church could accomplish. Because I feel like, uh, especially in the United States in modern times, a lot of Christians have a, a very low view of what the church can accomplish. So let's just go through this mental exercise and think about what, what could the church accomplish if every Christian in every local congregation walked in the fullness that God has for us. So before we get into uh, a list of 12 things that I have that I want us to kind of envision or think about. I just want to say that the church can accomplish a lot if every member does a little. The, the, the church as a whole can accomplish a lot if every member does a little. I want to look a bit at Nehemiah chapter 3, a few verses from Nehemiah chapter 3. So in Nehemiah chapter 3, uh, Nehemiah is trying to get the walls of Jerusalem rebuilt. The walls of Jerusalem defend Jerusalem. And, you know, Jerusalem got invaded and the walls got destroyed basically or damaged and now they need repaired. So Nehemiah has been tasked with seeing to it that the walls of Jerusalem get repaired. That's a rather big job. But it got done. But let's look at how it got done. Let's look at a few verses. Nehemiah chapter 3 verse 28. I forgot to put that one in my notes. Above the horse gate, the priests repaired, each one opposite his own house. So the priests were working on the gate that they called the horse gate because it's a wall that goes around the city and it has gates at various points. And each priest just repaired the part that was opposite his own house. None of them tried to repair the entire gate. Each one just did the little part of the gate that was next to their house. Let's also look at verse 10. Next to them, Jedediah, the son of Herapham, repaired opposite his house. And next to them, Hatash, the son of Hashabaniah, repaired. Let's also look at verse 23. After them, Benjamin and Hazhub repaired opposite their house. And after them, Azariah, the son of Messiah, uh, the son of Ananiah, repaired beside his own house. And let's look at verse 29. And Zadok, and after them, Zadok, the son of Emir, repaired opposite his own house. After them, Shemiah, the son of uh, Shechaniah, the keeper of the east gate, repaired. So, uh, giving away the ending of Nehemiah, they got it done. Amen. It got repaired. But the way that it got done is each person took on a little bit of work. It wasn't a lot of work. Uh, well, there were people who took on probably more than just opposite their own house, but quite a lot of people just took up repairing the part of the wall that's next to their house. And I just want us to kind of get from that that the church can accomplish a lot if every member does a little. And sometimes members don't feel like doing a little because we, we feel like, you know, my little bit's just a little, it doesn't count for much. It's not going to do anything. But every member doing a little has a lot. All these people repairing the little bit of the wall next to their house led to the wall getting repaired. Let's also look at Ephesians 4, verses 15 and 16. Uh, 
Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body to grow so that it builds itself up in love. So the church grows when each part, each means every, when every part is doing what it's supposed to be doing. So the church can accomplish a lot if every member does a little. So let's start this mental exercise on how much the church could accomplish if we all walked in the fullness that God has for us. There's uh, 12 ideas I want us to consider if every Christian did these things and if every local congregation did these things. The first one, consider if every Christian considered God's kingdom to be the purpose of their life on earth, which we should. Let's look at 2 Corinthians 5, verse 15. And Christ died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him uh, who for their sake died and was raised. Let's also look at Matthew 6, verse 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So all Christians are supposed to live for God and to put his kingdom first. And that's supposed to be played out in practical ways. But oftentimes we're tempted to kind of put God second or put God in his kingdom next to something else, especially as Americans. Uh, It's very tempting to just pursue the American dream and think this is what American Christians do. We just work our jobs and, and live and die. But God wants us to consider Uh, our relationship with him and the expansion of his kingdom, the purpose of our lives. And he wants us to put that first and to be seeking to do whatever we can to take part in that. But if every Christian really considered that the purpose of their lives, just imagine how much of a difference the church could make. So that's the first idea I want us to consider. The second one is, if every Christian was committed to regular prayer and fasting for kingdom progress. Let's look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 4 and verse 8. I think I printed the wrong scripture sheet. But maybe I didn't. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, and trust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Um, I think I meant 1 Timothy. (laughs) 1 Timothy, if we could get 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 through 4. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people for kings and for all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to knowledge of the truth. Let's also look at Matthew 6, verses 17 and 18. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. I I include this just to point out that Jesus says when you fast. There is an expectation in the Bible or an assumption that Christians are going to fast, that Christians are going to, uh, and this is kind of mentioned in the context of prayer, that Christians will fast at least occasionally as part of their prayer. And lastly, let's look at 2 Chronicles 7, verse 14. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. 
If every Christian was committed to regular prayer and fasting for kingdom progress, we would be seeing more kingdom progress being made. But this is something that every Christian should be committed to, praying and fasting for the progress of the gospel. Because God desires to work through prayer and not apart from prayer. So how much the church prays does affect how much we see God move. For an example of that, let's look at Matthew 9, verse 38. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. So Jesus was telling the disciples to pray that more work or more gospel workers would be sent for the sake of the gospel. But God could obviously just send more workers without prayer. So why request prayer? It's because God wants the work of the gospel to be done through prayer and not apart from prayer. And because of that, how much Christians pray will affect how much we see God move and how much progress we see being made with the gospel. The third thing I want us to imagine If every Christian sought to share the gospel with others and was ready and looking for opportunities to share the gospel. Let's look at Matthew 18 verses, uh, Matthew 28 verses 19 through 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age." So one thing we should always notice about the Great Commission, or Matthew 28, 19 through 20, is that this command to make disciples must be a reclusive command, or a recurring command, because it's a command, and Jesus is in this command saying to teach others to observe all that he has commanded them, and this is a command. So everyone is to be part of making disciples of all nations. Let's also look at 1 Peter 3.15. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do so with gentleness and respect. So every Christian has a part to play in the Great Commission, and every Christian should be ready to share the gospel if opportunity comes up. So at the end, we're going to kind of put all these ideas together and just kind of imagine, you know, what would be going on in the world if every Christian was doing these things. But imagine if every Christian sought to share the gospel with others and was ready and looking for opportunities to share the gospel. This is something I myself don't do very well at and need to do better at. Number four, if every Christian managed their finances with the purpose of giving to farther God's kingdom as much as possible. Let's look at Matthew 6, verse 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Seeking first the kingdom of God applies to every area of life. In every area of life, we should be seeking first or having as top priority the kingdom of God and the expansion of the kingdom of God. We should have as top priority our our obedience to God and also seeking to further the gospel and the growth of the church. Let's also look at uh, Luke 16, verses 9 through 11. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. One who is faithful in very little is also faithful in much, and one who is dishonest in very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful with uh, unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? God cares how Christians manage money. And God wants us to, uh, to use unrighteous wealth for kingdom purposes. God doesn't want Christians to not care about money or to be poor stewards. He wants us to care about money and to seek to use it for his kingdom. Money isn't evil. The love of money is evil. And Christians are called to manage their money for God's kingdom. I also want to look at 
uh, 3 John 1, verses 5 through 8. Beloved, it is a faithful thing you do in all your efforts for these brothers, strangers as they are, who testified to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their journey in a manner worthy of God, for they have gone out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support people like these, that we may be fellow workers with the truth. When we support workers of the gospel, we are fellow workers with them. So the church does need people to be frontline missionaries, but we can't all be frontline missionaries. We can't all get up and leave Dayton and quit our job and go share the gospel in all the places it needs shared throughout the world. Some of us can't even um, go to other parts of the states and do that due to circumstances. But when we support other workers who are working for spreading the gospel, we are taking part in their work, and we should think of it that way. That's what the Bible says. And all Christians should be seeking to do that. Every Christian should manage their finances with the purpose to further God's kingdom. And as the church starts to do this more and more, ministries will be well-funded, and ministries that are doing well will have more room to expand, and new ministries will easily be able to start. So I want us to imagine if every Christian managed their finances with the purpose of giving to further God's kingdom as much as possible, how do you think that would look? How much, how much quicker do you think we could make progress? But the next thing I want us to think about or to imagine, if every Christian tried to make the most of their time for God's kingdom. Let's look at Colossians 4 verse 5. Walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of time. Let's also look at Ephesians 5, verses 15 and 16. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of time, because the days are evil. And lastly, let's look at, so those are two clear commands that Christians should try to make good use of their time. You only have a limited amount of time, but you can do things with your time. But let's look at um, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. So I want to point out that this is the letter to the Corinthians. This is not a letter to Timothy. This is to all Christians. This is to lay people. This is to everybody. This isn't just to quote-unquote professional ministers. He says to everybody, to Christians in general, to be always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord our labor is not in vain. All Christians can do things with their time for the gospel. Even if you're not um, going to be in full-time ministry, all Christians can do work for the gospel. Christians can volunteer. Christians can spend time in prayer. Prayer is labor. Prayer is work, and it is a valuable work. All Christians can spend time evangelizing. All Christians can spend time learning and growing. The more we learn and grow, the better equipped we are to, to help others and to take part in the advancement of the gospel. But learning and growing takes time. Reading takes time. And reading is important. But any Christian can spend their time on these things. Any Christian can use their time to befriend other people. And that makes a difference for the sake of the gospel. Befriending others is a labor of love, especially, you know, in, in the modern world, life has gotten lonelier than we realize sometimes. It can be easy to just live life without having any close friends. And that is a, the case for a lot of adults in the United States, I think. Another way we can use our time for the kingdom is doing work, extra work to make extra money. Because Christians should care about money. Let's look at Ephesians 4, verse 28. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. It's a godly thing to work for the purpose of making money. That is the only reason I go to work, personally. 
I don't know about y'all, but it is a godly thing to do if it's honest labor. Paul did say honest labor. But imagine if every Christian in the world tried to make the most of their time for God's kingdom. How much of a difference that could make. That could make a huge difference. But every individual matters. We should never feel that the contributions we could make to God's kingdom are small. Every member of the church is important, just like every member of a body is important, even though each member of a body can't necessarily do that much on its own. You know, my pinky finger can't do that much on its own, but I would be very, very upset if ever I lost it. My hand as a whole would become less effective, and I as a whole would become less effective. The sixth idea I want us to consider. If every Christian walked in their spiritual gifting and regularly used uh, the gifts of the Spirit. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 12, verses 4 through 11. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it's just the same God who empowers them all and everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. So these are uh, the gifts of the spirit mentioned in 1 Corinthians 12. And it says the Holy Spirit apportions to each. Every single member of the church has a gift of the Spirit that they should be able to walk in regularly. Even though we might not get to choose when we want to use it, we have to work in cooperation with the Holy Spirit and we have to listen to his voice. Each member of the church should be walking in a gift of the Spirit regularly. Let's look at 1 Peter 4 verse 10. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. So God gives these gifts throughout the church. But imagine if every believer learned how to use their, gift, their spiritual gift. If that happened, every local church would have the gifts of the Spirit being used. And that would be awesome. Every local church would have the gospel being backed by signs and wonders. Every local church would have supernatural wisdom from the Holy Spirit. Every local church would have the comfort and encouragement of the Holy Spirit. And this is how things are meant to be. And we're looking for, you know, God to restore the church to where it should be more and more as time goes on. But imagine how awesome it would be if every Christian walked in their spiritual gifting and regularly used it. This is God's design for the church. And God will give the church grace to get there. The seventh thing I want us to imagine. If every Christian walked in their authority over demons and knew how to minister deliverance. Let's look at Mark 16, verse 17. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons and they will speak in new tongues. God gives authority over demons to every believer. And as we saw earlier in the series, demonic activity is more common than we might think because it's not actually Hollywood style, typically. It's not that blatantly obvious most of the time. There's very subtle demonization that goes on frequently. But Christians have authority over demons. And if every Christian walked in their authority over demons and learned how to minister deliverance, like imagine how much of a difference that would make. The eighth idea I want us to consider, if every Christian treated all other Christians like family. 
So last week, we looked at the idea that all Christians should think of other Christians and actually treat them as family. Let's look at Matthew 12, verses 46 through 50 again. While Jesus was still speaking to the people, behold, his mother and his brothers stood outside asking to speak to him. But he replied to the man who told him, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand toward his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. And it's the will of uh, the father that we believe in Jesus. Jesus is saying that anyone who's a Christian is his true family. But let's also look at John 13, verse 35. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. So Jesus expects to, the world to see the glory of God in the church through our love for one another specifically. And that is best shown when every Christian treats other Christians like family. And we might not be there yet, but the church can get there. And this is God's design for the church. Imagine if every Christian did treat all other Christians like family. Unbelievers would really see the love of God in the church. And Christians everywhere would be much better off. There'd be much less loneliness. And each person would be much more supported. The ninth idea I want us to consider. If every Christian took studying the Bible seriously. Let's look at Joshua 1 verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Let's also look at Deuteronomy 6, verses 6 through 9. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit down in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be... Uh, as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So God wants Christians to take the Bible seriously and to really study it. But imagine if, and you know, we've all had times in our lives where we don't take studying the Bible seriously. It's very easy to fall into it. It happens to everyone. But imagine if every Christian in the world did take studying the Bible seriously. Christians would know God better. Christians would be able to defend their faith better, and Christians would have more wisdom. But this is something God does want for every Christian. The tenth idea I want us to consider is if every local church equipped its members for their ministries. Because every member of the church does have ministries. We all have ministry to God, to others, and to the world. But let's look at Ephesians 4, verses 11 through 12. And Jesus gave the apostles, the prophets, and the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers to equip the saints, to equip Christians for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. Imagine if every church was diligent to teach its members how to parent well, and how to disciple others, and how to walk in spiritual gifts, and how to be a good steward. But I believe that God is working in the church constantly to cause the church to grow and cause the church to get closer and closer to meeting its potential. But imagine if every church really took seriously equipping its members for the ministries they have. The 11th idea I want us to consider, if every local church ministered to the poor in their area. Let's look at James for chapter 1, verse 27. Rel Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Now I say local churches rather than Christians mostly because I think that a group of Christians together, aka a local church, is far more capable of actually helping the poor in an area than individuals are. There's a lot of uh, synergy in us working together in effectively helping the poor can take a lot of effort. 
It's not necessarily an easy thing to do. It's something more for churches to do together than necessarily for an individual to do by themselves. But imagine if every local church did minister to the poor in their area. If every local church just in the United States even ministered to the poor in their area. What a difference that would make. And lastly, let's consider if every local church had organized efforts to share the gospel in their city. So we've, we've already mentioned the Great Commission, uh, but churches should have organized efforts to share the gospel because there's power in working together. There's synergy in a local church. Local churches can accomplish more than disjointed individuals. And also, as local churches grow, they should eventually plant other churches. So I, I don't bring up any of these things uh, to make us feel guilty. God's grace is here for us in every one of these areas, even if we're not doing well at them. But again, the whole point of the sermon is to help us have a vision for how effective the church could be. Because I think the church could get to a place where every Christian does do these things and where every local church does these things. But I just want us to really get the idea that the church has great potential. So I want us to put these together and just think about it. Imagine if every Christian considered God's kingdom be, to be the top priority of their life, and every Christian was committed to regular prayer and fasting for kingdom purposes, and every Christian sought to share the gospel, and every Christian managed their finances for the purpose of the kingdom of God, and every Christian tried to make the most of their time, and every Christian walked in the gifts of the Spirit, and every Christian walked in authority over demons. And every Christian treated all other Christians like family. And every Christian took the Bible seriously, or studying it seriously, and knew it well. And if every local church equipped its members for their ministries, and every local church uh, ministered to the poor in their area, and had organized efforts for the gospel in their city, imagine how effective the church could be. But this is real. This is real potential that the church has. So that being said, uh, we all have a responsibility to make a difference. Like at the beginning of the sermon, we talked about Nehemiah and how Nehemiah's efforts to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, a pretty big task, succeeded because a lot of people did a little bit. And the church is like that. The church can make major progress for the gospel when a lot of people do a little bit. But the church can only be this effective if everyone is committed to doing their part. So in conclusion, I just want everyone to remember that the church has great potential. The church is capable of doing these things, and if Christians start to, we'll really see big, you know, quicker progress being made for the gospel. So let's close in prayer, and then we'll have our communion meditation. Dear Lord, we thank you for your grace for us, and we thank you for your love for your church, and we thank you for your vision for your church, Lord. We thank you that you are going to restore uh, your church, and you are going to work through us for the sharing of the gospel, Lord. Uh, we pray that you would just give us grace, and that you would help us uh, to focus on you and your power and your love, and, uh, and we thank you. So today's communion meditation uh, is about... The, the fact that we have to trust in Christ to sustain us. Let's look at John 10, verses 27 through 29. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. When a person comes to Christ, they do so because the Father drew them to Christ. And since God is the one who, who draws us to Christ, he's also going to sustain us and keep us in Christ. And as Christians, we can have confidence in God that since he gave us faith, he's going to sustain our faith. Let's look at Hebrews 12, verse 2. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith 
or the author and perfecter of our faith, some translations say, who for the joy uh, set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So Jesus is the author of our faith. He gives us faith because we can't come unless the Father draws us, but Jesus also perfects our faith. God is going to sustain those who come to him. No one can snatch a Christian out of the Father's hand, not even that Christian, because the Father is greater than all. God will sustain us, and by his grace, we can trust him for that. So let's praise him as we come to the table. Jesus Christ is one loaf, and all of us who partake of this bread are one loaf in him. All of us who have been sanctified by his blood partake of one cup. Please stand for our benediction. In a few moments, members of the prayer team will be at the front. Uh, Please come forward if you desire or are in need of prayer. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.